<laughs> well, brothers, I want to thank y'all for joining me. Uh, this is such a pleasure to have Brother Slade and Brother Muhammad right yeah. here on the Pulse. You know, because I know you, I'm trying to be on the Pulse, but y'all are on the Pulse, right? <laughs> no, 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 you're the navigator. You're the navigator. <laughs> uh, open, open line uh, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a, a famous uh, introduction to our community to change some things. And I, I wanted to let you guys know that I'm, I'm thankful that you all are willing to join us here on the Pulse today to talk about uh, the legacy of, of what you do and the legacy that you bring to the table. So I want to start off with the, well, let me just actually take a step back because, you know, we're missing two people here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're missing right. Brother M. Tume and, 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 and Judge Pickett. Right. Uh, but, you know, we know that they're here in spirit, so we leave spaces for them just in case. <laughs> right. well, no, we'll, we'll pour a little libation. Yes, 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 yes. Let's toast it up. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. But I want to uh, start with you, Brother Slay. Can you just tell me a little bit of, about uh, this whole Thing that you guys do, this 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 open. Why even the name? I mean, uh, that you uh, came. There's a little with. story about that. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, toward the end of the summer of 1989. I was in the program director's office. His name was Tony Gray, and uh, we, we said we're going to do uh, a talk show. We're getting rid of all the old tape, the programs that we had on the air, mm -hmm. public affairs programs. We're going to start our own. We're going to put black people on the air. That's what I want. I want black people on the air. And so, uh, what are we gonna call it? I said, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open the phones, you know, open up the lines to these folks, and we're gonna put them, stop right there, brother, stop right there. That's the name of the show, Open Line. And that was the name, of, that's how it became, Open Line. We uh, began our first show, September 21, 1989, um, a Sunday. It was me, I was hosting it along with our public affairs director, Milton McLean Dennis. She's not in the radio business anymore. She lives down in the uh, D.C. area. And uh, that was the beginning of Open Line. And um, uh, when Milton left the show in uh, 1994, uh, I turned to the third answer, Brother Ann Toomey. I said, hmm, I wonder if he'd be interested in doing this every week. Because he had just started working on the, uh, the score for, uh, this was the TV show? New York Undercover. New York Undercover. Okay. And I said, um, let me uh, see if I can draft brother. And so uh, I, I, I called him up and said, would you like to do a show? Because we had done shows before. Mm -hmm. We had done like year-end shows. That's correct. And he, I've known Toom since 1986 with doing interviews. You, Me, and He, the first one that won his, uh, his second album for uh, CBS, uh, Epic. And so uh, I said, Brother Toom, would you like to do a show on a regular basis every week? He said, well, brother, I don't know. Uh, I said, you can say anything you want. You know, you can get on the air and cuss people out, talk about their mama, whatever you want to do. I said, come on. And he said, uh, all right, I'll do it. And he joined the show. Now, Brother Patine, uh, I uh, put him on our softball team. I, you won a contest or something like that, right? Wanna, what was that, what was that contest you won? I won a contest where you call in and you, and you be the 98th caller, and I won $500. And on that day, if you had a kiss card, it doubled your money. So um, what happened is I was playing softball in the city. I was also security for the United African Movement, headed up by Reverend Sharpton, mm -hmm. Attorney Automatics, and Attorney C. Vernon Mason. So um, by playing softball around the city, I ran into a couple of uh, other softball players, and I saw them with Kiss FM jackets. I inquired and found out that Kiss FM had a team. So when I came down to pick up my winnings from the station, I inquired, and they said, well, Bob Slate is the manager of the softball team. I said, oh, okay. And uh, they said, when the time comes up, you know, we have him reach out to you. But I wasn't gonna leave it up to Bob Slate, even though I didn't know him at the time, I wasn't gonna leave it up to him to call me. I kept calling, and he, he told me when it was, I had to come down and try out. I, I just didn't make, you know, this was put on a team. So I tried out and made the team. And one thing led to another, you know, I would quiet about volunteering because I enjoy listening to the program. So boss like, okay, maybe one day, one day I'll get you to come down. So it was a Saturday, I'll never forget this, it was a Saturday and me and Bob was talking, he said, you know, something Reverend Sharpton was involved in. He said, man, I really wish I could get in touch with Reverend Sharpton. I said, I can get him right now, hold on. Got him on the phone and after Bob and Reverend Sharpton had spoken, uh, brother said, well, why don't you come on down and volunteer? So I went down to volunteer. There was three interns. One is a gentleman, Dean Memager, the son of former New York Knicks ball player, Dean Memager. He's on New York One now. 
That is right, be manager. Be manager. Right, and what happens is once their internship ended, they left, but I was still able to volunteer. As Bob was saying, there were some changes at the station, and the producer at that particular time when Bob Slave mentioned uh, him and Milton doing it, was a gentleman by the name of Sean Court. And 98.7 KISS was going to integrate or start off uh, a KISS inspiration, a gospel show. At the same time as, as a talk show. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens is Sean Court wanted to be the DJ, and he went into that role, and he said, Brother Fatim, I really can't produce now because I'm doing that. And of course, you know, Bob Slave said, you know, I agree. Bob Slade, of course, trained me, and I was there, and I was there when he brought Brother M. Tume on board, and of course, one thing led to another. I think it was it, not it was the OJ trial, right. where Bob Pickett would come down, and then sometimes that M. Tume would be caught in the studio, and he couldn't make it, so it would be Bob Slade and Bob Pickett, and once uh, M. Tume got a better hold on New York Undercover, and things were going, and cool, until then. That was the tr that's how the triangle started. It was uh, Bob Slade, the third answer, Brother M. Tume, and of course, the attorney Bob Pickett, and then of course, myself as the producer. Yeah. That's an interesting journey. I mean, I think that, that, you know, probably not a lot of people know that story, and I think that this is a, gives us a good opportunity to kind of see uh, the synergy. But you know, one of the things I wanted to say that, that I think is important here, especially for young folks watching, is the persistence. You know, your persistence in wanting to be involved, wanting to be educated about the process and, 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 and staying to what it is that you were, you were interested in that led you to have the, create the possibilities. The possibilities didn't just appear, you made them. You came in talking about baseball, but you ended up doing something completely different than that and your persistence, your desire to be involved uh, created an avenue. And so for young folks out there, they, they have the opportunity, they just have to figure out how to create those opportunities. Well, you know, um, uh, a football player, former New York Jet player, once said to me, and I, I use this when I go on speaking tours, um, I said, there's no such thing as luck. And I, Dan, uh, what's his um, uh, you know, I'll come to you in a second, a football player, Ed Marinaro was his name. Uh, he ended up starring in Hill Street Blues and all bunch of TV shows. Uh, he said, he said, you know, my old coach said to me, he, said, he asked the players one time, he said, what's the definition of luck? And nobody loved Clubhouse knew what he was talking about. He said, it's when preparation meets opportunity. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's no such thing as luck. If the opportunity arises and you're prepared, bam. And I add luck. one one other piece to that, and that's perspiration. Because <laughs> you gotta put in some serious work. Yeah, you know, right. and, 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 and your well, that's part of the preparation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. all part of that. And uh, and so um, that's really what it's all about. You know, you have to be uh, everybody says, Well, I'm lucky. No, you're prepared for that. You knew this was going to happen. Luck is like, you know, when the opportunity arises, you're prepared. It's like buying a lottery ticket. You know, you prepare. You have five dollars in your pocket. You put the five dollars down. You bought your lottery ticket. The opportunity arose. <laughs> give me that money. Right. Well, well, well. <laughs> it's interesting. I look into this slightly a little different because I was passionate about radio. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed music, but I enjoyed the delivery of the disc jockey and. Of course, I remember when 98.7 KISS was born, of course, Bob Slade was there, but as a listener, um, when 98.7 was born, coming from 99X, um, and BLS, of course, 107.5, uh, I'm not saying I was a, a big fan at that particular time, but I was growing up on that 99X side. So when 98.7 KISS was born, as a listener, I was out there in the street, so I enjoy what they did. Go back a little further, before KISS, I believe, was 92KTU, how that station just popped up. By, that popped up and word them out on the streets. And the ratings that uh, 90, 92, it was 92.3 KTU at that particular time, got one of the highest ratings during our old system, the diary system in Arbitron. That was the fall of 1978. Right. During the disco era. Right. And that, uh, what happened with that period is when uh, our listening patterns changed. We didn't listen to, we wanted our music uh, in stereo. Mm -hmm. We didn't want it on AM radio, which right. was dominant back in those days. So the bandwidth, uh, the band that we wanted to hear our music on was FM, not AM. AM slowly died, didn't play music anymore. FM was the uh, dominant band when it came to listening to music. 
And the 19, and, and that rating book came out in the uh, winter of 1979, the famous rating book. Tony Gray, if you're out there, you have that rating book. You stole it from the radio station. But, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's a classic piece because that, was, that changed radio, period, across the country. It definitely did. Mm -hmm. But as you talked about... 92 KTU. Yeah, mm -hmm. but as you talk about being ready or about being lucky, I had no desire to be no producer. I didn't know anything about producing. Uh, but what I was doing, as I mentioned, I was security for Reverend Sharpton. But at the same time, with the softball going down, I was starting a family. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, you know, a lot of issues were going on. Bensonhurst, Tawana Brawley, I was one of the special security detail on, you know, the Tawana Brawley case. Um, I started a family, and I remember going on a protest rally with Reverend Sharpton. And my job is to protect Reverend Sharpton at that particular time. We got surrounded by some people in the neighborhood, and I didn't know which way to go because I had my wife there, who was pregnant, and Reverend Sharpton. So I told my wife, I can't bring you out here no more. But then I realized I can't hesitate on that job. This is real. I was there when Reverend Sharpton got stabbed in Bensonhurst. So at the end of the day, I said, you know what? Hey, I, I need to be able to continue to make a difference, but I don't have to always be in the street now. I can do it on another platform, and Bob Slade presented that platform, and he talks about, and you probably get into it, talks about passing that baton, and the brother gave me an opportunity, I didn't know anything about it, about producing, but I was passionate about radio, and being able to bring that conversation into your living room, and one thing led to another, because I'll be honest with you, for 20 years, I worked in data center, computer operations, and I was producing open line. And now I'm at the stage where I produce two national radio shows for Reverend Sharpton. I left the computer world after 20 some years and now I'm on a national level and trying to get open line and Bob Slade out there on a <laughs> national level also. Yeah, well you know, once again, I'll go back to being prepared and when the opportunity arises, you were prepared to walk through that door and take that job. That's why I say there's no such thing as luck. It's when preparation meets opportunity. And, uh, and, and you know, you may disagree with degrees of it, but it's still the same. Uh, you have to be, when the opportunity arises, you got to be ready to go through that door. A lot of people just don't do that. And, and a lot of times, well, the other piece is that we have people who, are, who the door presents themselves and they're scared to go through the door. Yeah, that's right. You know, so you also have to take the initiative, yeah. you know. And so, you know, I think that one of the things I want to talk about with you all is that <clears throat> the initiatives that you take, some of them are cutting edge. Some of them are controversial. Uh, how do you navigate that space where one, you know, you have the three of you who may, or the four of you may disagree on something, but then the other side of that where you have issues where you all may be on the same page and the public may be at a difference. So how, how do you navigate that space where you have these, these strong oppositions in terms of things? Well, I understand this. You know, this is show business. Yes. Yeah, so nothing changes. Yeah. We're doing show business right now. Y'all are not this is show business. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell all our secrets. No, no. <laughs> it's the same thing. You're putting on a show. Uh, and when you put on the show, you have good guys and bad guys. You have uh, issues you're for and against. And in the process of building that show, what you do is you start strong or you try to start strong. The middle is where you give all the information out and you end strong. So the audience will come back to you again next time. There's something in that show that they want to hear, and you put on you're putting on a show. It's just like a television show. It's like you know American Idol or any other kind of show. You, uh, even uh, on MSNBC, all the talk shows they do. You start out with a big issue in the middle. You have some other stuff going on. You end with something, and then you close out with either a funny thing or something to remember or something they can take home with. Uh, we close out our shows with information that you may not have uh, heard from other places. We give out, you know, community announcements. Hey, this is going on in the community. You need to go and check it out. But we start out, bang. In the middle is all the other stuff that's going on. And the phone calls and the people participating. You get the audience engaged. And then that's throughout the broadcast. And then um, you, 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 know, you put your program together and you end strong. It's all about a show. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are elements of that that are important to the community, yes. But in the, in the reality of things, when you break it all down, it's really about a show. We believe in that, Melvin Man Peoples once said to me, he says, a lot of people who are in the business, especially in, the, um, in white media, uh, 
it's like uh, an attitude of don't woke them, let them slip when it comes to our community. In other words, you don't play, uh, don't give them information shows, play a lot of music, right. keep them dancing, play some records, you know, put videos on TV, do that kind of thing. And they'll be happy with that. Mm -hmm. But no, we want more things than that. We want you to talk to me. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what's happening in the world. I want to know what's going on. I want to know whether I'm going to live or die when I wake up tomorrow morning. And well, on the note about whether or not you're going to live or die, we're going to take a, a quick break. This is Dr. Kalfani. You're watching The Pulse. You always made sure I brushed my teeth. You told me that smart was cool. You always told me to dream big. To all of those parents who took the time to make raising their children their most important job, we'd like to say thank you. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thanks, Mom and Dad. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Air Force. Oh, hey, bud. Where, uh, where are you headed? Uh, just going to hang out. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. I've been meaning to ask you, is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. If any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. The American dream need not forever be deferred. This is the richest and the most powerful country. Well, welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Kalfani. I'm right here on the pulse of what's going on in the African community. And you know, today we have some great folks here with us today. We have Brother Bob Slade, the one and only. And my friend, uh, Fatim Muhammad. We're missing the other two parts of the open line show. You know who they are, Brother Ntume and Bob and Judge Pickett. Uh, so without further ado, though, I want to move right back into this discussion here. <clears throat> uh, you, Fatim, you were suggesting about something uh, looking at controversy and uh, how these controversial things happen. Can you just elaborate a little bit more about what you're talking about? One of the first things is I just want to compliment and commend Bob Slade is that when Open Line was making this transition, and I'll get to the controversy in a minute, when he was making this transition from uh, Milton McLean Dennis going into James and Toomey and of course then attorney Bob Pickett coming on, uh, Bob Slade was looking at the media and especially television and radio when it dealt with black media and the issues that we were dealing with. But he was looking at the sense of, wait a minute, we don't see black men having conversations out there. And uh, Bob said, you know what? I'm going to create something to where black men are dealing with issues just like you see white men deal with issues on television. We're not just out there snapping our fingers and, 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 and making a fool of myself that we can hold a conversation just like anyone else out there, especially in the mainstream or white media. Uh, when we talk about controversies, um, there may be certain figures that are controversy. You had the late uh, Brother Khalid Muhammad, who was formerly of the Nation of Islam. You have Minister Farrakhan, where some people feel that you can't have one on the radio. And I remember both gentlemen have been guests on our show uh, more than one time on uh, the open line broadcast. and. Um, when I brought it up, Bob Slade said, let's do it. And I remember where we brought Brother Khalid Muhammad on, and we was challenged by a gentleman, a white gentleman, who wrote an article uh, to our advertisers. He wrote, and it, it appeared in the New York Post, and he came at us. And the station backed us. And it was so interesting because at that particular time, it, we were at 98.7 KISS FM under Image Broadcasting, which was white-owned, black-formatted radio station. And what, what was very interesting is I've seen um, black-owned radio stations 
like on television stations that would not have touched those individuals. They may have mentioned them. Why do, but why do you think that is? Why do you think that those folks who ran and owned those TV stations, that the TV stations, were willing to step out on a limb? Uh, do, some people might suggest uh, that that they were doing it because they're you know they they're still in control uh, of what was going on, and that that you didn't. That you that you thought you were controlling something, but they ultimately controlled the image. Uh, so you may have both sides of the argument. So what would you say to that? Well, one of the things I'll say here, and, and I'll let Bob Slade elaborate, is that management at that particular time at Kiss FM trust Bob Slade. Bob Slade was the news director, and they trusted this man. They they he, he came up with the ideas of the talk shows, Open Line, The Weekend Review, Soul Beginnings, and they trusted him. So at the end of the day, they trust his judgment. And when any time there might be something that came up, they may call him in the, in the office to find out what's going on. But after he explained what it is, they knew that we were a talk show. And there may be controversial, controversial figures or controversial issues out there, but they trusted this man out here. And Bob Slate never let, them, let us or uh, the shows any, any, in any negative direction. Yeah, I tried to keep most of that drama away from the players because uh, they need to be concentrating on the show. I was saying, uh, I'll deal with these folks in the office, the front office. You know, it's like, the, it's like a manager of a baseball team. Uh, you basically go in and say, well, look, uh, uh, you know, like you see the manager of the Yankees or the Mets or something like that, and you say, well, look, I'll deal with management. Uh, what's your problem? All right, I'll deal with these, go these guys over here. And I'll keep that from y'all. I'll let y'all know what the progress is and what happens to it. But they, yeah, they basically trusted us as a program uh, that, that they knew that we were going to take it in the right direction and that the station wasn't going to get harmed and we weren't going to lose sponsors and they weren't going to lose business because of it. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's what it is. And, and we had a track record of doing that. We won a bunch of media awards and things like that uh, that gave us uh, some power. Well, that's, and that's a powerful thing. Speaking of power, uh, I wanted to, uh, I got two other questions I wanted to, to consider with you all today. And that is, one is about uh, looking at, 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 at black or African men. As men of African descent, uh, you had some ideas, some thoughts about those things, uh, Brother Fatim. Why don't you uh, tell us what, you were, what, what your thoughts were? Well, at the end of the day, um, black men are under attack, uh, were under attack. And when I say we're under attack, and we still are under yeah, attack, I'm say, you yeah. know, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, we still are. We go pre-Million Man March, the image of black men, uh, not only in this country, but across the globe, was not good. When you saw the news, you saw us coming out, you know, the perp walk, with hands behind our back, um, um, uh, other stories that you saw that went global, or the other issues, it was negative uh, images of us as black men. We were not considered or taken serious when it came to uh, talking about or dealing with issues uh, of, of concern, not only in a black community, but mainstream issues. They didn't have us talking about that. Then at the next day, if you start to look at the news, you start to see they integrate white male anchor, uh, black female. So basically, what do you do? You know, you have the whole thing about equal opportunity. So what they do? What do they do? Kill two birds by one stone, as they say. Well, we we hire a black, we hire a woman. Left out the black man. So at the end of the day, you didn't have so many outlets, media outlets, that had black men talking about mainstream issues, not just issues in the black community. Mainstream, there's politics. Before there was a President Barack Obama, there was other issues that affected us. And that's why I say Bob Slade, he's the one, he was the visionary and said, hey, you know what? For us to be taken serious, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to do what I can do. I may can't change the world, but what I can do in this medium, I'm going to take, it, I'm going to take that chance, and I'm going to do that. And Bob Slade said, I'm going to bring a group of black men, intelligent black men, and we're going to discuss issues, all issues, black issues, white issues, mainstream issues. And for that, I think, I thought, and I know, that helped. That helped images here in New York City. It helped. I hear young folks coming up saying, man, I was listening to Open Line, man. We pattern our shows after Open Line and this, that, and the other. And we didn't just stop there. 
we also implemented and dealt with issues that affect women and we brought sisters in and we still do. But at the end of the day, Bob Slay changed that image, at least in the tri-state area, that black men could have those kind of conversations. So I'm gonna uh, uh, toss the final question to you then. And, and as we wrap up here, I want you to talk about legacy. You know, what is the legacy that, that, that he speaks about that you bring to the table and that Open Line brings to the table for our community? Well, we still have a problem with black anchors because on television you don't see that many. Hosting the 6 o'clock news, or you see a few here and there, but we still don't have that many. Uh, male anchors. You, know, you, you see the females, but you don't see the brothers. Uh, we still have a problem there. You see a, a brother reporter here and there and so on and so forth. As far as anchoring, no. Uh, we still have a problem there. Um, that's got to change. Uh, as far as the talk shows are concerned, um, what we're trying to do is set a model for others to follow. Like I said, we, I like to call this infotainment, not entertainment, uh, not information totally. It's we're giving you inf information in an entertaining way. We try to do it that way. And so uh, you have to have players that are willing to buy into the concept. Uh, and you have what you see on television now is really all these shows. If you watch these shows, they're really open line and we can review on TV. Right. You know, I'm looking at, I was looking at that show there. Look, 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 they got panel discussions. I'm going like, whoa, what's going on here? Well, it's the same thing. Yeah, I'm glad to see it happen. But on the black radio side, you know, I'm sad about radio because radio is trying to compete with uh, Pandora and somebody's, uh, 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 somebody's um, you know, portable music machine or whatever they're carrying with them uh, and just playing songs after songs and not even talking to people. Radio is designed to keep people interested in knowing that there's some life outside or the other, uh, there's something going on outside. The disc jockey is important. The disc jockey was the person that you realized was on the air talking to you. We've taken that person out of radio and we re replaced him with songs. Right, right. And that's sad. Uh, so what we're trying to do is bring that back. We try to do it with our shows. We try to have them entertain. We play, we imitate television. Television imitates radio, so what we do is we turn around and imitate television. Where they, they play audio sound bites, they play you know, clips of you know, uh, stuff going on, music, we do that too. Well, speaking of television and radio, mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank you for... It's over? Uh, it, you know how quick, quick it goes. <laughs> you, legacy. Yes. Uh, real quick, open line. Legacy in the sense of providing a platform and making a difference. Meaning that uh, sometimes you saw issues being dealt with in our community on the news. It was a two or three minute soundbite. We provided a platform to deal with that issue. Making a difference. We made a difference in a lot of stories. And one story I would leave you with is the Central Park Jogger story. Bob Slade stayed on that. We at Open Line stayed on that. And those boys were wrongfully accused and it finally came out. And we made a difference. And this man led the charge on that. Well, it's always good to have good players on your team. You listen to them and say, hey, we disagree every once in a while. But when it comes down to it, it's all about the show That's and it's all about getting it on the air and letting people judge for themselves what we're doing. I think it's all about the people. But I <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll let it rest with that. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, brothers. It was it's my pleasure to have thank brother you. Bob Slade and Fatim Muhammad right here on The Pulse. I'm Dr. Kalfani, and I want to thank you for joining us. Stay tuned, because we're going to have more shows, more great information for you on our next segment. But for right now, we're ending up with Open Line. Peace.